and welcome to the Daft Souls podcast, episode number 14. Four. That's my favourite number. Is it? No. Oh. <laughs> Just thought we'd add a bit of uh, character. So, anyway, yeah, this is, uh, we've managed to get back on the horse, and today I am joined by Mr. Quentin Smith. Hello, Mr. Matthew Lee. And Mr. Christopher Bratisville. Hello, Chet. Bratislava. How are you? Is it, is it Bratislava or Bratislavaville? Uh, I just tend to go for Brat. Just brat, on its own, really. Brat. Yeah. The problem is, I've, I've, I, I called you the Brat earlier. Mm. I, I think it's a Twitter thing. It's weird, isn't it? I really wish I could drop that the so badly. So Obviously, yeah. Badly. Like, if, in case you haven't worked out, Chris Brat is the Bratters on Twitter. Are you nice. going to consider like, Australia? Australia? This is excellent. Yeah, like because I know, obviously, um, Jim, my uh, replacement at, at uh, video gamer, mm-hmm. he was previously Game Wank, Jim. Yeah. <laughs> and then changed to plain wank Jim. Yeah, that was good. And now it's changed to old dar Jim. He's he's had a complete They let Jim do whatever he likes. He's had a you. complete not, rebrand. I tried to do that. I even as I mentioned in a podcast but before. Are you telling me they're not letting you change your Twitter account? Because it's well, it's across everything, isn't I'm it? I'm pretty like, sure you're allowed to I am I am. It's mean, like a human rights violation, if, actually. If I cared more if I cared more, of course it wouldn't be well, an issue. I was gonna say, are you gonna It would be it'd be a frustrating because it's it's like lifted on all sorts of stuff. On video gamer, and yeah. it'd be a pain to have to change yeah, it. Change. We're just lazy. That's that's generally. I just wondered if you ever gonna, gonna, yeah, because now in my mind you've become cemented as the Brattis. That's, oh, that's not. Good. And see, if you don't like that, you should change okay. it. Okay. I tried to rebrand myself once a few years ago and yeah. just become Quinn rather than Quinn's. Didn't work. I like. I was like, half asked about it. Was the problem? Well, that's too yeah. subtle a change. Does it? No, it's actually Quinn. Yeah. <laughs> you <laughs> have right? to be such a prick about it to like. Yeah, I know stop you do. It's conversation. It was because my actual name is Quinton, and nobody, everyone's like, what? Why? What? Yeah, so, ah, but right, Quinn, okay. people know. Yeah, so yeah, I'm yeah, yeah. don't don't do it. Don't. Mm. I've made my Quinn's shaped bed, which is a weird shaped bed. And you can never you can never get people to if you want to change your nickname, it never works. No. Somebody else has to change it for you. Yeah. Um, it never works. Like <laughs> that man did not go down well at all. Did you just show not up at the at office all. one day and? Uh, <laughs> hey guys, it's Brad. Guess now. what's changed? It's, it's, it's my name. And no, it, it doesn't work very well. Anyway, an uncharacteristically name based introduction. Mm-hmm. Um. Quince, what have you been playing in my kitchen? You were just playing a game, and you were clearly really into it. Oh my god! Okay, so Etrian Odyssey is a series. You know how we were? Uh, I think one of the first half souls ever. I'm going to turn it on. So if there's a sort of pleasant <laughs> piping music, it is pretty lovely. You can put it a bit closer if you want. Yeah, I'll put it a bit closer. Four. Get that. So you know how we were complaining about JRPGs generally being uh, sort of not very good in uh, one of the first uh, couple of Dark Souls? Well, I think it's more that we love them so much that they disappoint us. Well, yeah, so we, we don't like, you know, the combat and the grind, which tends to be stuff that gets in the way of all the nice flavours and stuff. Etrian Odyssey is just good. It's just a genuinely... Hang on, hang on, hang on. How, how long have you been playing it for? This one? Yeah. Well, this is the thing is, like most JRPGs, like <laughs> I found with Brody Default, I spent the first 20 hours, this is just amazing, and then got to the end game and was like, fuck, fuck you. We're expecting a big number here, Quinns, that's what we're saying. It has uh, to be above 30, otherwise you're going to be Oh, hours. Void. Well, like, hang on, let me just dodge that question. <laughs> <laughs> so, an interesting thing, a uh, bit of background on this series first. Edge Odyssey is a dungeon crawler, like a roguelike almost. You have a town, and there's a big labyrinth, it's called in the games, and you explore the dungeon, and you go deeper and deeper and deeper, and like a roguelike, Monsters get tougher, like Demon Souls even. Like, it sounds a bit torchlighty actually as well. Like, yeah, well, yeah, all these games basically, okay. I guess, yeah. what we've discovered is use the You're same thing. You're gonna have to turn the jaunty music off, otherwise it's just gonna play havoc with the noise correction. Oh, really? It's fine, it's fine. It's oh. all good. Oh. You can... <laughs> have can... you got some headphones? I can, I can layer it over if you want. Like, I can have Etrian Odyssey music playing in the background. If you send me a YouTube link to what okay. you want. Well, we might do that. Uh... For us, in this room, we have to use our imaginations. <laughs> okay, well, if I sort of click my fingers here and it comes back in, Absolutely. So anyway, the uh, you explore a dungeon, stuff gets tough, and you collect bits from monsters and you come back up, but it uses the DS's bottom screen for you to draw a map. Yeah, so, I heard about that. Yeah, you? and actually I found out just come out in Japan is a Persona game for the 3DS, which is about all the Persona 3 and 4 characters meeting, and it uses the same mechanic where you're exploring a labyrinth and you draw it on the bottom screen. And it's good because you say, big monster here, don't fuck with it. Um, oh, that sounds awesome. But, uh, but so, Etrian Odyssey 2 was for the DS. I played about 50 hours of that and rage quit. Etrian Odyssey 3, 50 hours of that, rage quit. This is 4. I'll tell you what, I'm 10 hours in, it's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> ever. But right. I've, I've, I've sworn to uh, to my girlfriend, she's going to make sure I do it, I'm going to finish this one. 40 which hours I'm sure later. will not... Ca- well, yeah, I, I think it's probably about 100 hours long. 
Yeah, that's the thing is like, what, why did you rage quit with the last two? Well, I believe it just got extremely difficult. Maybe too grindy. Honestly, I can't quite remember, but what I'm gonna do here, <laughs> look, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. So look, I'm just gonna go into my status. I'm gonna click on Lee's and look, that's Matt Lee's in my party. Oh wow, that, you can take that, you can read your stats. Look, I, this looks, this, it looks just like you, doesn't it? Does it does look a lot like me when I had a haircut, actually. I, I'm kind of wearing a big purple cape. I'm a lady, I think. No, you're a man. Oh, right, I'm, I'm a oh. man with fantastic legs. Fantastic <laughs> legs. Um, and what else you got? I'm you're a night seeker. A, you're a night seeker. That's with an N, not a you K. You seek knights or you're a knight that seeks things? He's an, he seeks the knight. Okay. Basically, he he's DPS. But the thing in Natural and Odyssey is you can have like all these characters, name them after your friends, which is obviously what you do. You can customize them a bit. And uh, and everybody has different skills, but there's a lot of personality put into that. Like, you might have to swap some friends out in different dungeon layers, or you might have encounters where you really need, for example, a medic or a dancer or something. And then you get, oh, your friend Brendan the dancer. And hey, <laughs> come on, Brendan. Brendan. Brendan Caldwell the dancer. You know what you need to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, see, Matt, you're looking gross. You're going around the menu system. I'm you... looking at things. I'm looking at things. What, what have you found? I found... found the fact that you, as everybody always does when playing any form of RPG, have never named yourself after the character with a big shield and a big weapon. <laughs> nice. The one who most looks like a knight. That's true. And I'm, I'm a tank. I don't actually do any damage. I always choose to play tanks The thing is, well. you, you put me to shame. You do crazy damage. Oh, also, as a night seeker, just like in real life, you are extremely good <laughs> at causing damage to people who are blind, paralyzed, yeah. uh, if they have their arms or legs tied up. It's true. I do you, say very hurtful things to those people. You do. So I th it's a perfect class. But it's just, it's engrossed me wholly. Um, and the thing the Eternality games have done that's really sinister is they've got a touch of the mobile phone game sort of... Games these days are getting very good at putting layers and layers on layers on layers. Like how XCOM is engaging because between missions you have a base and within the missions you have people who gain XP. So actually, honestly, you have your labyrinth, but now they've split it into labyrinths around a world. So you have an overworld that you explore as well and then Ooh. missions. Yeah, and the overworld is, is yeah. mapped. You fly a hot air balloon in Action Odyssey 4. You've got... Uh, wind eddies and you can find oh, I'll tell you what you can find if you fly away far enough you'll find distant herds of sheep and if you eat those <laughs> if you eat those rare sheep you'll get different buffs when you go into the dungeon Crikey. that sounds well, actually headed. really good yeah it does <laughs> it was, I forget that's the nice thing about when, when they do that thing with JRPGs of actually like rather than trying to reinvent the systems just each time making them a bit better yeah it's Final honestly Fantasy did that weird thing of like they kind of nailed it with Seven, with the Materia system. The Materia system was just really good. Well, I tell you what, uh, my girlfriend's replaying Ten at the minute, and Ten was good. And Ten has the Sphere Grid, which is great. Yep. Twelve had a really great real-time MMO system, which was my favourite. Yeah, Twelve fantasy. was great. No, that's that's so fair. weirdly they nail it every time, then change it for the hell of it, which yeah. is cool, I guess. Yeah. I guess you're right. But um, no, one other thing, the final thing I will say about Etrian Odyssey that I like, in similar to Monster Hunter. There's an adage that the best, you can tell how good an RPG is going to be from the first town. And uh, what actually Odyssey and Monster Hunter do is go, oh, well, tell you what, let's just make the first town really good and the only town. <laughs> so you're constantly coming back to this hub full of NPCs you can grow attached to and you can have conversations with them and, and your reputation will change. And uh, so, yeah, just really lovely. To be honest, you had me sold from the, the list of items that you were selling in the kitchen just. Oh, was like, sweetheart, you had me a cheap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what? No, yeah, I was flogging. Frog cheek meat, I think, was a, Frog cheek was a meat. good one. That's but, not bad. Frog yeah. fluid, that's rare. Yeah. Uh, get, get some good gold for... Yeah, some good gold for frog fluid. I had some bendy wood. Um, and then the, and then different items. Because there's only one shop that sells equipment. The equipment they sell is based on what you bring back. So when you kill a big yeah. monster and you get its face, you take it back and she goes, I can make a really good shield. That's nice. Out of this face. I like, <laughs> yeah. I like that element in Monster Hunter, but sometimes it was really fucking annoying when you're like, Oh, I've got loads of three of the things I need, but then the fourth thing I have none, and you've always got to go and kill one yeah. thing like yeah. eight times. Monster Hunter is doing shop, is going shopping basically. Yeah, mm. um, but uh, actually, you just reminded me. I, I probably talked about this uh, on a previous podcast. It was probably a video game and podcast actually, though, when I was there. Um, it's a cracking podcast. Yes, <laughs> good podcast. <laughs> Went downhill, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. Um, but yeah, no, um, Crimson Shroud. Which was uh, one of those like level five Shroud. downloadable. Oh, yes. oh yeah, 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 yeah. The one which has miniatures and you. Yeah. It's all done in the tabletop aesthetic. It's miniatures and lots of like writing. Lots of like lots of it is just. Well, there aren't any cutscenes because it's just like you get shot off the miniatures that are the characters <laughs> are and it comes up with text. But it's got pretty good writing and has like really interesting story and really interesting backstory what? and this weird like combat system whereby. There's a weird like rock, scissor, paper 
combination thing going on where it's like you use fire, then use ice, then use lightning, then use earth or whatever. And every time you use the next attack in the chain, or if an enemy does, so if you know what attack an enemy is going to use, then you'd be like, okay, well, they're going to use a lightning attack, probably. So I'll make sure I use that attack before they attack. And then you, when you chain it up, you get awarded with new dice. Because oh, it, it's using like um, the kind of tabletop system. It means that how it works is that when you're rolling for an, a normal attack, you're like, your, your weapons or whatever will be like 2d6. And that's like quite a good weapon. Um, that you roll, you actually physically pick them up with a stylus and oh, roll wow. them. <laughs> but then, if you want to have a better chance to hit, or if you want to do more damage, you can then you have a pool of dice at the bottom. You can use your bonus dice, and you can use them at any point. So, if you want to do shitloads of damage with one attack, you just like bring out all the dice. But then it has this nice <laughs> mechanic of being like, you save the dice, and then when your dice slots get full, every time you do this new combination, one of your earlier dice gets turns into a better one. Oh, so, right. this so weird even the thing dice themselves. Like, yeah, so you can basically get from like they start off with a D four and then it'd be a D six. Do you not find that you just, you're just really wary of actually using the dice because you want to keep them going? Yeah, and it only really works because the game is really short. Yeah, because yeah, um, it has this thing of it doesn't allow you to ever do that thing that RPGs do of ending up with loads of loot and stockpiling. Yeah. It means that you have this thing of I think how it works is at the end of each chapter, the dice you have left over. Um, you then can spend those dice to get like, it has a weird thing of like, here's all the loot you could get from that battle, um, but you have to pay for it. And it's like, you haven't got enough points to buy all of it. And you can get more points by trading in dice that you've got left over. <laughs> oh man, See, so, we're in the weirdest place right now. It's a really odd game, but it's it's lovely in the fact that it only lasts for about four hours, but I'm kind of torn with it because it was like, it was a great experience, but, and it had an amazing story actually. Like the finale of the story was just really, really satisfying, a really awesome oh, short story. Like you should definitely get it um, because it's it's a bit frustrating in some ways. It's a bit uh, wonky. It's made by the guy who made um, made the guy who was the lead behind, I should say, of a uh, Vagrant Story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it has the same art style. No, I remember it has a pedigree, but it also has a really irritating systems that are like really number based and obtuse and kind of like a bit shit hmm. in terms of how the menus are set up. But um, part of me just wanted to keep playing and was like, this is kind of cool. Like, I would have liked to see this be a full game. Well, that's always the way with like tiny experimental games. It's always that if you like them, it's always, well, why wasn't this a full game? But the beauty is, is that because it's a short story, they have the freedom to just tell a short story where you can be engaged and there's no fluff. And it's really nice the fact that it's like has moments where you walk in, you see a waterfall and it's like, oh, you're reminiscing about something. Do you want to reminisce? And you're like, yeah. And then you have like <laughs> this backstory. Because you don't nope. have to. Don't care about That's waterfalls. It. But the thing is, like, if you didn't do that, it'd be like, well, you're missing out on this it's, game. This game's only four hours. Yeah, it's, it only has about <laughs> five characters in the game. And it's all about, like, you work out how the party met and stuff. And you work out about them. And then and then it tells a little mini story with them all. Yeah, I get and, that. Uh, it's yeah. nice. I, I guess ugh, we kind of have such an expectation when you were talking uh, about the game you played this week. Like, we expect that you've played that game for tens of hours. It has to be. It's a JRPG. You need to sink real time into this. I think a the ambitious thing about... JRPG... Um, yeah, I think the interesting, interesting thing you can do with short stories as well is the fact that people are more accepting of of uh, more deviance from like templates with short stories, right? If you're if you're having a long story, then people expect a certain type of art. Yes, yeah, and that's why with JRPGs you always have that bit where you get towards the end and then suddenly it seems hopeless, mm-hmm. <laughs> and then you somehow. Yeah, you yeah. saved the day. And it, I, the I arrogant protagonist time, gets a heart, you know, like yeah, I can't, and emotions. I can't, I can't remember the last time I played a JRPG that ended with, a, with like an unhappy ending. Like, yeah. you often have an unhappy middle bit. Like, if Final Fantasy VI classically had that. Final Fantasy yeah, yeah, XIII yeah. Is, is a little bit, I guess. Uh, it's, it's, it's sad in, in some respects. You, you kind of you achieve your goals, but. Yeah, no, no, everyone makes. Whereas I don't want to spoil anything with Crimson Shroud, but it's just like it's able to tell a different type of story without any shame because I guess it doesn't feel like it's all it's done is it's introduced the characters to you. Is these are these characters? They are these people. They know each other like this, but it doesn't really give you enough time to spend with them to feel really attached, and so it can then do the whatever the fuck it wants with these characters, and you enjoy it just as a story, yeah, and not as a personal story, yeah. And I think that's something that video games often like. I guess struggle with a bit. One thing that's really cool about all the sort of the resurgence of indie games and walking simulators, and I mean, however you feel about them, 
and obviously I think we all like them, but even pessimists out there, you have to admit, these are allowing designers to experiment with new stories. Like, yeah. the way that Gone Home told a story knowing that it was only a short game, it could do all kinds of stuff which are lessons which can then be incorporated into other games, you know, knowing that characters have really short art, you're making a one hour game. These are all going to allow designers to do different special things which can be taken into AAA if that's your I actually um, think you can't make a good story in a game that isn't it. Unless you've like really done it well, a good story in a game that that isn't like quite sure, like a really fucking good for a story to be really really fucking good. I think the game, oh, it just gets so hard to pace it's, it. It's, yeah, I, I think you raise a good point with uh, with JRPGs in particular. And like, it, they're sometimes the game's limited in what they can do with the characters because if if say they killed off one of your the characters you use in your party midway through a story, there yeah. are obviously games that do that but like a lot of the time you'll f- you'd feel really cheated because it, yeah like you say it is a personal story like you've made sure that character fits your party perfectly yeah there's, there's only so much they can do and until also, the very end I, of the game I think I've only ever played like maybe a handful of games that have had the balls to let you play them for about 15-20 hours nope and then given you a really bleak ending <laughs> Um, <laughs> just because I think people feel like they've earned a you've earned happy something. Ending, yeah. yeah, you've earned something. I, 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 I guess that's it. <laughs> Making stories for games is just endless limitations. There is very little sort of benefit to you compared to just all the stuff you have to entertain someone for twenty hours. You have to keep them engaged. You have mm. to reward them, as you were saying. Like stories can have. Like imagine the road as a video game. I mean, yeah. it's a it's such a cliched example, but I talked about it a lot when I was writing about The Last of Us because. The road is an interesting contribution to apocalypse fiction because it is a downhill struggle. It's bleak, and The Last of Us feels necess- feels it is necessary to give you so much positivity throughout. Like the the final level, I'm sure it's okay to. Well, there's a spoiler klaxon now. Spo- <laughs> giraffes. Uh, when the giraffes <laughs> show up, it's like it's beautiful. But on but if you look at it from a slightly other different angle, it could also just be a parody that like. Well, the the player has sat through a lot of really tough stuff, so let's give them a giraffe. giraffe. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and now, okay, it's hard again. And then, uh, yeah, I'd love it if that was a trope in video games. Yeah, hopeful like, giraffe. Oh, well, no, got, <laughs> the giraffe always leans into shot. <laughs> Somebody sitting in a design thing at like GDC and being like, "This year, my talk is about the giraffe loop." <laughs> How often do we need to give players a giraffe? I mean, if we do it too often, mm. is that manipulating them? <laughs> I guess I am full of shit because Silent Hill Two was able to achieve cult status despite being unremittingly bleak. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing is, I find it interesting when games, like, aren't unremittingly bleak, but then do something a bit bleak towards the end. Because often they, they leave that, they do that in the middle, and they use the classic kind of cinematic formula for storytelling of being like, you have your thirds almost, of like, you know, you yeah. have your duh, 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 and then you always end on a certain note. When a lot of times you have games that will be really bleak in the middle, uh, but then will resolve themselves. Sometimes they'll still be a bit sad. But it's always nice when you have things like I still think the and it's a crap game, but I still remember just being blown away by the Game of Thrones RPG <laughs> because the ending you can kind of see it coming. Yeah. There's a point towards the end of it where you just suddenly go, I was just playing it. And I'm like, where's this going? Where's this? Where's this going? I couldn't work out, and that kept me going for a while because I was like, why are you going to do this story? <laughs> And then suddenly there was this point where it was like, it was quite subtle at first about something. There was a, because obviously you meet a lot of characters, talk to a lot of people, and then there's these two little things. There's a bunch of backstories going on, and you, you suddenly find this thread, and you realize there's something that links the two backstories together. And you go, hang on a minute, this backstory might connect to this? But then you go, hang on, no, no, no. If it does, that's really bad. <laughs> and then it does, and it's just like, Oh, and then you, you realize from that point onwards, it's like this is going to end really badly. Yeah, then you read the name Game of Thrones and you, and you kind of go, "Oh, you!" But they you. beautifully did it. They, they they leave it with a choice. And yeah, it's like, I I do keep meaning to go and play that game I, just because of the the it's way you worth describe just that. Whacking on that's easy, it. whack it on easy, blast through it, yeah. laugh at how fucking shit it is a lot mm-hmm. of the time. The Am dog I right stealth sections, mental. George Double R is in the game. Yeah, he is excellent. He's I'm a on character board. in. Uh, <laughs> In what's it called? Moles, Moles Town. Moles yeah. Town. And it's just like, what the fuck were they thinking? Isn't Moles Town largely made up of prostitutes? Yeah. Excellent. Okay. He's, right. just, this he's is, just there. This does sound like an interesting take. The mental thing is, I actually, I interviewed the guy who did it and he was basically going, yeah, like, we didn't know. They basically got, they got the contract to make the game. Well, they, they pitched for it or whatever. When it was just the books. <laughs> And then they, got, <laughs> and then they got like it was like cyanide and spiders who consistently make games that are a bit crap but have really interesting ideas. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it got to a point where it was like, 
then the TV show came out and it was really big and suddenly they're like, oh my God, we're making a game for something that's really popular. And yeah. then they put in like a couple of likenesses, like, so you have like Jorah Mormont and stuff. And oh crap, yeah. That, Jorah, that, like, is them. That must be a bit strange because I, it's really I, I've done the whole thing. Of, like, <laughs> I, I, read the, I read the books, but now I've seen the TV series and my kind of memory of what those characters should look like has completely I honestly think shifted. if you like if you like interesting RPGs and you love the Game of Thrones books if you're just a fan of TV show I wouldn't bother you'll just be sitting here going what the fuck is this yeah, but because it's based on the books there is so much detail in terms of like everything about it like there's so much stuff that's referencing the books really strongly it's probably one of the best in terms of lore one of the best examples of really like going the extra mile I was I was gleeful but yeah so horrible, such a horrible ending, and it lets you. It does the. It lets you choose. There is there is a choice to be made at the end of the game, and you kind of know that it's like both of these choices are bad. Yeah. Like, <laughs> you're not gonna. There's no happy ending here. It's like what, what flavor of shit do you want? <laughs> I was gonna ask the incredibly open ended and slightly tedious question of why do games need happy endings? But then I realised that movies have happy endings, and I basically I answered my own question. Just sat here thinking. And then I was I kind of realized that we're kind of going through a TV renaissance right now and it's TV that games can look to much more comfortably because of the episodic format mm. and because they have to put out a lot more content and because they often have fixed locations and blah, blah, blah. And TV is often learning now that, hey, moral gray areas and not happy endings and I think games might just be slightly behind the curve. I think so. I mean, like, uh, I, w- I won't... Sp- Spoiling the thing, but uh, I know a lot of people. Uh, True Detective is a series I've recently watched, and I thought mm-hmm. it was fucking brilliant. Yeah, I was mm-hmm. blown away by how good it was. Really. And it's also it's one of those pieces of media like Gravity where you look at it going, "Why isn't this a game?" Or at least I did. Yeah, it definitely feels like it could have been. Um, but at the same time, what I loved about it, a lot of people felt very conflicted about the way it ended. And I love the way it ended because I mean I won't spoil anything, but it ends in an ambiguous way. It doesn't end in a way that feels satisfying. Mm. It ends with lots of the things not quite tied up. Yeah. Um. But but not with the sense of being like, hey, come back for season two. No, it's yeah. just like it's- and we'll tie it up. It's like you just sort of goes, it's never going to be tied up. Like, mm-hmm. That's as good as it's going to get. And a lot of people couldn't deal with that. And I think I'm not. I think with games as well, people would be far less willing to deal with that. Oh, you know what I heard that was fascinating recently? Um, uh, so a friend of mine, uh, hi Ian, I know he listens to this podcast. Uh, I, I'm allowed to say this, I'm not going to get you in trouble, don't worry. He translate. <laughs> okay. He works as a translator for Japanese games and mm-hmm. he was telling me, check this out, Walking Dead just launched in Japan and it done terribly. And really? the reason it's done terribly is because Jap- Japan actually, Japan actually has a series, of, a history of visual novels and uh, sort of choose your own adventure type stuff with lots of moral branching paths. And the thing that it got slated, I think it got quite good reviews maybe, but the, the thing it got slated for is that you cannot change the ending. And for like 15 years, Jap- the Jap- no, God, it would be like 25 years now, the Japanese games industry has been refining this genre, but always the ending is always what forks. And in Walking Dead, it doesn't. You're sort of meant to take poignance from the fact that characters think differently of you. Yeah. But the fact that you cannot change, essentially, every episode leads onto every other episode. It all leads towards the same ending was thought of as a huge rip-off in that particular cultural context. Yeah, which well, I, I think, I think there were people in the West who felt the same way. Yeah, I, I, but, and I think that there is, there may, there is maybe a point there. Like there it's, it is disappointing to play through The Walking Dead a second time around and realise that your choices aren't as impactful as you may have first mm. thought but yeah it's weird that the ending in particular is like so what, what would what would an ideal ending be do you think an ideal ending I suppose it would be all the actions that you've done that they will remember this means yeah. that at the end so it actually everybody. leads to <laughs> imagine that like everyone you've ever been nice to <laughs> burst through the door and kills it yeah I don't know it and somehow I, dramatically is, saves you I, I, somehow I don't know man there isn't like I, I like the even the way Fallout handles its endings it's it was a very basic setup. it's often like still shots but it it reminds you what you've done and, and what that's meant now. Yeah. I, I feel like... I don't think it would take very much, just a sense that this the whole game hasn't been a magic yeah, trick. I guess exactly. the problem is with that, though, is with The Walking Dead, they wanted to do Walking Dead Season 2, which yes. is going to be a sequel, so they can't be like... But the sequel is an entirely often. new character. Yeah, but I know, but... What happens to Lee could... could it could be anything. Mm. No, I know, but I think they, what, they couldn't do the whole, like... Well, all these characters went off and did this next because they're still not. Yes and no. I think if they wanted to, they could have. I think they chose to focus their energy in a particular way, and I think the ending they chose is good for all kinds of reasons. Yep. But I definitely, definitely wouldn't give them ex- the excuse if they couldn't have done any different. They made their choices. Oh no, they made their choice. I'm not saying they didn't make a choice with it. Um, but yeah, I know what you mean. 
and uh, it's just it's, it's strange it's strange how we just you have to kind of use this this template to a certain degree in order to make a, a good chunk of people feel satisfied yeah. one of the things I'm really struggling lately is the fact that uh, I noticed lots of games doing this and now I get to the stage where I almost get paranoid when I start playing. When I start is playing- it belts? Is it loads of belts? No. On <laughs> all over. No, that's been going for a while. Okay. The bloody character design covered in belts. It's more like when you start playing games, when I start playing Transistor, which is a good game. I really enjoy Transistor. Um, at the start of it... Have we talked about Transistor on the podcast yet? Uh, possibly not. We could talk about that for a little bit because actually I'm, I'm going to make a video about it. Um... It's an interesting game. Yeah, I mean, I actually am about as big a defender for Bastion as you're likely to find. I adore that game. Um, I actually was lucky enough to meet the voice actor of the narrator, whose name I forget, both the character and the actor, which is great. But the guy who talks <laughs> to you for, for the entire game, and I think that's my biggest sort of, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. <laughs> oh, wow. Just, my just say, things, say my name. Yeah, say, say my name. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Tell me what yeah. I'm doing it right was, now. It was <laughs> awful. I mean, I was a I, poor guy. I'm so sorry um, <laughs> to you. But yeah, so I was Boy, so... Boy, the voice actor. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, he was annoyed. Um, that's a funny joke. Uh, but no, I was so ready to love Transistor, and I just tore my heart wide open, and it it, the, it couldn't quite. Yeah, no, I, I found the same thing, and I mean, I actually, I think I, I loved it. I, the problem was, I had the exact same thing with Bastion. I really wanted to love Bastion, hmm. and I really enjoyed it. And there was a period in the middle where I did love it, when the combat like kind of hit a peak, and like you had all these weapons and all the challenges. I thought this is fucking well good. But then I kind of was... I didn't think that the story and the ending was just... They didn't really... Oh, you finished it? I finished ba- I finished both, but with Bastion, the story didn't quite resonate with me hmm. enough. And I kind of felt like... I was weird. I was I couldn't quite work out why, but I felt like I was going to like it a lot. I felt like all of the pieces laid out on the table. I should really love this. And yet, in practice, I was like, it's good. Like, I... But you see, Bastion's like, it's a good eight. It's a really good eight. Like, oh, don't put numbers on a thing. I know. I, the thing that makes Transistor... I mean, to me, that's the thing is, I'm not... Uh, that's the thing is, it's no, it, yeah. yeah, I get it. But the thing with Transistor is it's like, I'm, it's the kind of game that makes me glad I don't have to put a score in it because that art and the music and just the vision of the actual game, I adore. Stunning. I, I adore, I adore. Speaking of which, I just, I want to talk about this a bit later, but I just watched uh, Tron, the remake, uh, recently. Oh, yeah, and that Netflix. was have you, you haven't seen it? I haven't seen it. Because it's just on Netflix, yeah, yeah, so I watched it. Yeah, have you not seen it? The remake? Yeah. No. Okay. Well, it's, uh, we'll get back to that. But uh, yeah, with Transistor, it's it's just such a gorgeous vision, and that's that makes it worth my money, unquestionably. The fact that the game kind of fell slightly flat. I found the weirdest thing was, like, I felt like, for me, the story in Bastion fell a little flat towards the end, because it's just I didn't really understand. Oh, so you think it's what, that the story's better here? I think the, the story's better. better in Transistor, but the combat, whilst it's, like, interesting, just isn't quite... Excellent. It's like it's close, but it it never really feels like a good action game. You know what really sucks like as well is that they must have they must have known it. You know, so it's you yeah. Know, you you have this labor of love that you work on with this really innovative combat design, and you've got to get like six months out of release or like eight eight months away from release and go. Well, I can't change it. Now. The thing is, though, it doesn't it's outstay not- its welcome. Like it doesn't. It's not an overly long game. And it's like, I enjoy the combat, I enjoy playing with it, I enjoy the way it encourages you to toy with everything and encourages mm. you to, to, to keep mixing it up, both through being forceful with you and by being, uh, like, you know... By offering I, the information. I haven't, yeah. I haven't played it, but what, what's the what's the incentive not to use the kind of pause the game and pick your actions? Like, is, is uh, that- there isn't. It, you're supposed to do that. Basically, just as a kind of a primer for you, if you don't know what it's all about, is... You can at any point you can freeze time, mm-hmm. and then you have a bar at the top, and it's basically like a time action bar, and you can choose to move around uh, and chain together moves with any any of the enemies you can get to in time, and then it all happens instantaneously. And then it all happens well almost instantaneously, yes. not quite. So you can still end up swinging at, at spaces nothing. where there are yeah, enemies. Right. Like, ah, so it means that you have to be quite clever later in the game, especially about what you choose for your last turns, because you're like you kind of into a point you can do clever things where you go, if I do this, then. They, the enemies will be here so you end up yep. setting up an attack at nothing but knowing there will be an enemy there <laughs> that's not yeah. it is really good but the problem is it's, it's just and it does this really smart thing that basically whenever you instead of getting killed uh, whenever you run out of health it like goes freezes for a second oh yeah that's really nice one of your abilities right right so then it means that until you finish the fight and get to the next like save point you can't use your ability. But then it has this thing of basically like, sometimes if you keep breaking them, means you have to get through several save points to get all of your abilities back, but you end up having only a certain number of abilities you can equip. 
But, and this is where it gets clever, all of the abilities you can use, you can also equip to your abilities as unique buffs. So everything <laughs> right. has a unique buff on a different thing. So it creates this, this spider web of possibilities that at first you're like, fuck, what? what? Mm -hmm. But then you end up seeing a lot of them towards the end of the game because... Uh, you end up like losing your abilities and end up having to be like, all right, well, what can I make with this set of things that will be useful? Or if you're like me, all the abilities are actually downloaded personalities of essentially reprehensible types who used to live in the city. People yeah. used to fight against the system. And to unlock everything about those characters, you, you need to use each one of them as an, as an upgrade to your character, yeah. an upgrade to a power and the power by itself. So I had a constant sort of, uh, it was like clockwork. All of my abilities would swap out and move so I could unlock everything. So you could read all of the, yeah, because it had lots of backstories. Which there. was great. And I, but yeah, the, um, as a whole, I wasn't given enough grit. It was like a sort of an individual fight, which wasn't hugely satisfying to another fight that wasn't hugely satisfying to the end of the level. And there's a new level. And I was never, I never felt like my feet were on the ground. Well, there were two things that it did really wrong um, in my mind. And that was, first of all, you, you never had any idea what you were up against next. And the way it worked is a lot of the moves were just some some of the moves were just so useful against certain enemy types and some of them and then useless against something else. So you have this thing, if you come into a room and you go and you just know, you don't mean to go, oh I've I've got the moves I've got now, this fight's gonna be hell. And the problem was it wasn't hell in a kind of fun way of being difficult it would just mean a lot of time spent running away and hiding until your freeze time thing filled up yeah which was like going back it, that I think probably is the nail on the head as to why the combat doesn't work because with Bastion it's like oh god this is going to be a hard fight and it would be then, intense and because there's no running away whereas ultimately Transistor the way they've built the combat means you can run you away can you can run regenerate away. you hide you let the bar come back then you freeze time you go and do minimal damage and it just means you kind of get to a point where you're like Oh, this is going to be a tedious fight. It's not going to be a hard fight. It's going to be tedious. But then also the other problem is the fact that it's the same thing of Bastion of allowing you to like basically stack curses on yourself of like which is which was an excellent feature in Bastion. Really smart. I'm amazed more games don't do it. Yeah, just it, would, it to, would reward you with like more experience. More experience basically, yeah. basically customizable difficulty. Yeah. I like and it's great for me because it means I can play a game where the enemies like for example are slower but all are like one hit kills. Yeah. Which lets you play the game as a shmup and you and but you build it yourself. It's like a little yeah. set of mod kills. It's great. And that's really cool. But then you have this weird thing of like it's satisfying to keep ramping up the difficulty and every time I got a choice of a new more difficult thing I always chose the one that came Gave me the most experience which just makes it the game harder basically because they're the hardest ones but then you get to this point where towards the end of the game the game was really fucking hard but then i had this weird thing of being like well it's really fucking hard and if i play a fight and i like get hit loads of times and get killed those times i'm gonna lose all of my best abilities and they're gonna take ages to come back and it's one of these weird things where like there's nothing to stop me at any point from just reloading my last save. And especially when you come into a fight and you realize you're not equipped properly for it, it means rather than having that thing of being like, oh shit, I've got to really work out a way of doing this, you just go, yeah, load last okay. save. And it's a weird, it's a weird thing about how like not enough games I don't think actually use save files uh, saving as a mechanic, you know? Yeah. Because it's like, it's sort of like, I mean, people will probably listen to this now who are probably gonna go, Matt, though, you don't have, just don't do it. Just don't reload your save. Just don't cheat the system. But it's like, as far as I'm concerned, like, it's not my fault. Like, if, yeah. that, if, that, if that option is there, it's not my fault. It just bums me out that, like, this is such an intrinsic part to making games that you can have a game that is so interesting, like, aesthetically and mechanically, and then, you know, the, the number one thing we need to say about it is, oh, why doesn't that come back quite well? It's like, it's so worth and it's it. More the, it's more the risk reward. It gives you, it has, it creates an incredibly clever risk reward system that rather than rewarding you for doing really well, punishes you for doing badly and forces you to rethink your strategies by basically, it creates a real and interesting punishment for death. Yes. But then doesn't have a system that stops you from sidestepping death I guess this by is, loading this is <laughs> this is a problem for me with the games press that I'm just this is coming up the top of my head but why is it that when someone like Transistor comes out with a new system that doesn't work we talk about why it doesn't work versus hey what can we learn from this what are the cool ideas we can take from this and what did work but no yeah. it's always the negative sure. thing of you shouldn't buy it because this doesn't work no what does work what's amazing I, I tell you what I haven't, I haven't played it but I've listened to that soundtrack so many times yeah. it's gorgeous <laughs> oh, like, I, I, I do mean to it's, it's a really really nice game I think it's one of those things where I think what it comes down to and the reason for that is it's not really picking holes it's more for me that it's like at first I loved it and I thought this might be something very, very special. And then it's like, I wouldn't even say it's, I don't even know what the answer to it is. It's just, it's, it's, it's annoying that what they've done is they've had a really novel idea about how to deal with risk and reward. And they've had that very heavily scuppered by tr 
a traditional game mechanic. And I mean, oh, what saving? You mean saving? Yeah, mm. I mean like that. But that is, in my mind, that is a traditional game mechanic. You save your game at a save point, and at any point you can reload. And I don't know how they. I mean, other than having a game which would have been like almost XCOM Iron Man of being like. It's always safe. I actually, I actually think the Iron Man. I think that would work. Is really that. smart because it, 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 there's there's an element of of pride. I'm not sure if that's the right word of of a, going through a game that you you know you really care about in an Iron Man run through. It, it feels it feels like you've achieved something. It feels like that's a big part of the experience. Well, they have the problem I'm, is it, big so of much of a, an option of what Transistor does is towards the end you can like you can basically you've got a limited amount of things, but what you can do is you can put your best attack and then two of your best buffs into it, and you have this one attack that's just beast. Like, but you've put so much of your best stuff into mm. it. So if you lose it in a fight, if you get killed, your most powerful nodes get smashed first, and it means then you go. Oh, like you, you, you basically, it, it's a game that allows you to put all of your eggs into one basket and then as soon as you get into trouble to just put all the eggs back in the basket. Yeah. <laughs> it's basically, unfortunately, because they've, they've built a system that, that really punishes failure, they've, the save system just acts as, as cheating in a really big way. Like it's just, yeah. and I couldn't resist temptation to do it. Yeah, like on face value, that sounds like it makes perfect sense. We'll let players invest heavily into one, one attack or one move. But I'll we'll punish them for yeah. it. But it, yeah, I guess I'd just be fascinated to know if they had conversations during development about the save system. Mm. And I, I really wouldn't be surprised if it ended up coming down to an internal thing of being like people, somebody saying eventually we have to, keep, we can't, we have to have the traditional checkpoint system because otherwise people will be too freaked out by. It. But it just felt like there was a a really notably jarring thing between the two. It was like this doesn't feel right. But anyway, anyway. But it's, a, it's a, as we said, like, I'm picking holes in it because I loved it. Um, yeah. It had a cool story. The art style's fucking ridiculous. It's gorgeous. Uh, the story actually has like one of my favorite moments in game storytelling ever, which I won't spoil, but I'd say if anyone likes games and stories, it's worth buying just for that. Uh, and if do, you don't, do, why the hell are you listening? If you don't, why are you listening to... <laughs> but yeah, to do with the terminals and um, the conversations you can have with the terminals. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, that, that's, yeah, that yeah, was yeah. some beautiful stuff in there. Really smart. Just gorgeous. Um, so, yeah. And, and actually, what I was going to say, the reason I brought it up in the first place was to say that the way Transistor starts is it's brilliant, actually. But when it started, I was like, I've got no fucking idea what's going on, who these characters are, <laughs> what this place is. Yeah, which is great. And it is good, but the problem is I kind of felt like, because so many bloody games have done it now, how they like pimp their games pre-release with like, hey, get the comic, watch yeah, the I, miniseries, I, watch the thing that I now feel sometimes like... Am I missing? I've had this exact <laughs> thought about. Um, I'm really looking forward to uh, Dragon Age Inquisition later this year, and it, like I already know, at least one of the characters from that has had a comic beforehand, and a few other characters tie into. Uh, Do the you care about that? Games. Is that important? It, to you? it is, yeah, because I, 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 the reason I played the Dragon Age games is largely because of the characters and those relationships. It just feels, story, you know, I feel the same. It annoys me. It's just like, yeah, like, and I could totally go out and read that material, but. I don't know. It just feels disconnected from from uh, my experience of the game. And imagine I if you went to the cinema and you saw the film and you go, oh, "It's a good film," but like the start felt a bit confused. Like it kind of expected me to know who the characters were a bit more than I did. And somebody said to you, "Oh, didn't you read the comic?" Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Oh, like a also, month ago. Uh, it's an interesting, and it is just your viewpoint that knowing everything about the character is the best place to start playing a game if you don't like we just established yeah, yeah, that you're right, you're one right. of the reasons Transistor is so neat is because you know nothing and you're able to learn through an innovative way I, yeah, I'm sure it quite I'll... worked in that because the thing with Transistor is I like the at first about how it's like you don't know what the fuck's going on but when I got towards the end of the game I kind of I still felt like it hadn't done enough to paint a picture of my point was. is it's all delivery it's all execution knowing the most about a given character isn't necessarily the best thing. yeah and, and you're right and I'll, I'll still enjoy that character I'm sure but in the back of my mind I'm like oh was that a reference to something I should know oh man that'd be really cool to know that wouldn't it everyone's really <laughs> would that it be moment. cool to know I don't Ever, know everyone is having so much fun with that sentence in, and that's just I mean, gone straight over my head the name of this podcast to do Dark Souls I mean Dark Souls is as fun as it is because we know nothing mm. and sometimes yeah. knowing nothing is actually really neat. but no but that's fine yeah but it's when you don't know nothing when you don't know anything be because you're not supposed to is cool but when you don't know anything because you haven't watched and consume the pre-release right. marketing Do you think materials. the people who make Dragon Age Inquisition are going to be writing for people who've read the comic? No, they're going to be writing know. for... No, they will write for just everybody. And that means if you play the comic, there's probably going to be exposition you knew about already. And how cool will you feel, Barry? Oh, is that it? Okay, well, in which case, yeah. No, touche. You will feel awesome as you're sat alone in your pants. Oh, guys, you, you didn't read the comic? Oh, right, no, don't worry about it. I don't know. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, it's not always as simple as like 
comics and stuff I think sometimes it's like maybe developers forget that you know that people who are playing their games haven't sat down and watched their video interviews with press about the world and stuff or things like this like sometimes it, it, they maybe think because there's so much of a part of, of development now especially big games is, is a kind of constant communication with yeah. fans and I find it very strange that like Transist is a good game don't get me wrong but it had so many fans before it was out it's like that's fucking weird to me it's like how can you be a fan of a game that you haven't played? Well, like you say, that art style. Yeah, sure. I mean, that's that's the answer, isn't it? <laughs> you know, but, the trailers, um, the soundtrack, it, it, it sold us because it is a game of art and music. But you, I kind of wonder sometimes if it's, it gets to a point where they're, they're communicating so much that they, they are almost doing that and they, they feel things. some things are a bit implicit because they go, oh, well, we talked about that so much that we probably don't need to make that explicit in the game. Well, I'm sure it's impossible as well when you're making a game to even get the distance on your thing you need. Like, what is it like for it, people seeing these characters for the first time? It's the same with, with, with sequels as well, particularly if there's been a bit of a gap between the releases. The, I guess there's a decision that has to be made. How much do we cater to new players? How much is that going to frustrate everyone? Yeah, sure. I'm saying you must like, forget, like, in the same way when we do this, I find myself sometimes afterwards thinking, oh yeah, I said that in the podcast, in jokes, didn't I? I'm like, in oh, no, I as well. I it's said that yeah. before we recorded the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> that they must, sometimes everyone, there must be lines that get blurred. So here's a, here, a non to slightly, but another game I've been playing recently that I've heard Joe Scrubbles did not talk about when you he recorded didn't. the podcast uh, yesterday. It's King of Dragon Pass, uh, which is a game that came out, a PC game in 1999, but now it's got all the mobile ports in the world. Um, I'm playing on my iPad and holy cow so this is a game where you run an Iron Age tribe it's kind of got a 1980s um, uh, choose your own adventure vibe orcs but orcs with like a C and they're mean and centaurs just orcs in the sea orcs with, with a C yeah. oh, okay <laughs> um, and you're running a tribe um, but one of the things it does is uh, choose your own adventure style stuff like you can go on you can send your heroes your carls on uh, on quests and it's always bugging me choose your own adventure stuff arbitrary uh turn to page 12 if you attack the ah oh, the dragon eats you and there's no <laughs> way to do this it's something that's always bugged me and finally it turns out in 1999 they solved it and nobody noticed so what this game does is there is lore and this ties into what we were talking about before there's a backstory to do with all the gods of your little iron age world as you're running your clan and you can unlock it. One of the things you can do in the game is do research. And all that unlocks is reams of text. It literally just unlocks stories. And more and more ah. stories get filled in. So you might... Uh, Humact, the god of war, I think. Um, I now know more about Humact than I could than I could possibly injure on our audience. The, uh, <laughs> well, I, I am glad, because now it's time for the Humact pop quiz. <laughs> uh, so it, well, it is his middle name. The game is honestly a Humact pop quiz. It, you'll learn about how Humact vanquished a dragon, and then you'll send a hero off to kill a dragon, and he must act like Humact. Because obviously, to these Iron Age people, Humact is the best warrior ever. So you must do exactly what Humact did in these stories that you have unlocked <laughs> by spending sacrifice, by sacrificing cows, essentially. And so that's just really good choose your own adventure stuff laid on top of an incredible, uh, really messed up management simulator. Like I, I, I tweeted about it and Joe was like, you've ruined me with this because he's now addicted to it <laughs> as well. And I said, how are you getting on? And he says, well, I just had seven of my noble warriors <laughs> killed by an octopus. That who the hell on is who act? <laughs> yeah, no, he, uh, he got slain by a walktopus, which is an octopus that walks on land. <sighs> And yep. uh, I, you see, and I was talking about orcs in the sea, and you look like a weird guy. <laughs> but octopus is walking on land. That's fucking fine. <laughs> it's just full of the weirdest decisions in the world. You guys have really got to fucking look it's, at your perceptions of sea and. They're known as things. octopuses. Walk to pie. Fine. Walk to pie. Fine. That is just a weird example of a game <laughs> with some lore that ties it into the game proper, and you learn as you play, and it's good. And people should download it. King of Dragon Pass for all your phone devices. That sounds amazing, like, because I haven't got a phone device no I have actually I think it might be on Android is it on Android I don't know I really have no idea I want to play it uh, but the problem is I've got the problem because I've only got a little phone right because I used to have a Nexus 4 back when I was a roller and then people saw me rolling and hated it etc ah, okay. but then I dropped it on the floor so mm. now I've got a, um, a um, Moto G does it play games? Uh, yeah, but it's got like a quite a small screen. Like it's not that small, like, but it's it's small for modern devices. Yeah, I basically can't play anything on my iPhone. Yeah, it's, too small. it's basically means any game because I've been playing uh, out there quite a bit, which I quite enjoyed, but then had this weird kind of constantly anticlimactic time with it. Really, if it's like 
a it's a bit like FTL where it's just like a space based roguelike oh yeah around. no I've played that we talked about it briefly on one of the podcasts yeah but it's not very good it's not very good unfortunately like I have moments where I, but the problem is I kind of had this at first it really frustrated me because I felt like I had no aim kept filling my ship up with what was effectively junk and then hit a <laughs> point where I realised what I st- and through no like learning other than just trial and error started to work out how to play it a bit better well see one of the things I do like about in fact the only thing I like about it is that it is pleasantly transparent with its gambling mechanics like I think yeah. it came up in our discussion of FTL because FTL just dicks yeah it. I was going to say right whereas the, sorry did I just tell you but I no, might no, no no I mean I was, I, was, I was thinking about saying that earlier because I had the same problem with FTL as, as yeah if you haven't seen it I made a video about FTL which featured Quint way <laughs> as long suffering uh, crew man number which one which is I really enjoyed making that video it took me months so watch it but you made, <laughs> you made a spaceship so. I did I made a spaceship from scratch out of CGI and magic and blood and sweat and tears Excellent. but um uh, yeah I love the way that in the captain's mode it started to do things a bit more like yeah I mean were, I think I mentioned it in the video but one of the examples was like oh you found a, a crying frying frying crying a frying a cr- ba- baby frying, fl- what something this? mantis uh, man- praying Frank mantis praying well, they wow call, they called the mantid I think was mantis. it frying or crying because that would be very well I'm not sure that my decisions would be the same it's just the way it's, <laughs> it was it was a, it's, Absolutely in tears. All oh, right, okay. So upset. <laughs> uh, but no, you find a cryopod in space and you get onto your ship and they're like, oh, it's a mantis warrior of frozen from space. And it's like, open it. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, I've, I've, I've tried it twice now and both times I've been like, I found one. I've been like, open it. And it's resulted in like, yeah, he's just like killed yeah, everyone suddenly everybody. Uh, because he's a fucking, like he's had his brain frazzled. <laughs> but I'm, I'm guessing there is a slight chance that he's going to go, Greetings, human. <laughs> I would be your super warrior. Um, but I like I like that because it's like it's such an evidently really dangerous thing to do that when you do it and it says, "Oh, if you're one of your men's dead," you're like, "Yeah." And this is exactly what I've been getting out of King of Dragon Pass because you manage a tribe and it says it's it's just sideways with its weird decisions. Like it'll, it'll a picture will come up of ducks, like literally human sized ducks tending a field, <laughs> and someone also. <laughs> And so, sir, we've found a settlement of ducks that look like men. There's hundreds of them. They don't seem very strong. We could take their land. (laughs) And you can ask all your advisors what they think, but basically it comes down to, why wouldn't we beat up the ducks? And you beat them up and take that, and everything's fine. Because that sounded like it made sense. And sure enough, down the line, the people who the ducks were friends with show up. The duck guy is angry. And they're not ducks. Mate, mate. No, they're, they're... all the other beast men, so centaurs <laughs> or minotaurs or other Jesus animals Christ. that are more threatening. That, but it is a game of of decisions that come back to bite you later, which is key. It's not <laughs> you the kill the ducks. It is no, it is. I it's love not, that. It's That's not so the FT, that was a beautiful one of. Um, it's, it's not the FTL thing of people biting your ass in, on immediately. Someone who uh, wanted uh, amnesty from another tribe wouldn't wouldn't even tell me what he'd done. He couldn't. He was too dishonoured. But says I'd really like it if he took me on as a warrior. And I said okay. And then three years later, which is like six hours of in-game time, people show up and say, "Yeah, that dude you accepted. We've decided we want to kill him. We won't tell you why either." And it's yeah. like, do you want to let him duel? And then it, this whole saga transpired across six random events across about ten years that ended with him dying on a mountain, holding his loved one, and we found them frozen in a block of ice. Good lord. Marvellous game. That does sound really good, but it'll be too fiddly to play on a tiny Android phone, right? Uh, I think Scrabbles is playing on his iPhone, so it might be okay. My God. You, tell you what, you can get it on Steam, though. Can you? Yeah. Ah, oh, I might have a go on that then, because I've been looking for... I'll be looking... I literally opened up Steam because there's been a couple of games recently, because I've been away for a week. Again. Like... Uh, <laughs> uh, but I, so, did you miss the, the latter part of the Steam sale then? Is yeah, that, yeah, pretty well, much. I, I mean, I've got too many games to play anyway. I was saying to, to Quinn's earlier, like, I kind of get trapped in like guilt loops where I feel like I'm not allowed to buy any new games until I finish making videos yeah. about the games that I've played. And I still haven't done Dark Souls 2, so it's like, we are not allowed any more games. <laughs> but it means I haven't played any games for like weeks. Um, so I should probably just, I don't know. But yeah, I saw um, Andy Kelly talking about Summer, Summer Sea. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, all I've seen of it is his very brief description and the screenshots and immediately just went, oh, <laughs> just underwater exploration where you end up having to eat your crew maybe. Yeah, something. I played their game, which was the uh, so a sort of real-time website game where you get actions every hour, but it's set in the same universe. And that was kind of marvellously Oh, bad. right. So they can definitely, they can definitely write. Uh, and I'm very curious to see how it turns out but yeah bizarre sort of reverse anti-London where you go if you die in London and uh, you know people have all bizarre professions it's very kind of uh, Tim Burton sort of meets Cthulhu nasty stuff 
But I, uh, Tim Tim Burton meets Cthulhu suddenly decides he's not so fond of Johnny Depp from <laughs> Johnny Depp to the Dark Lord. Because of course Tim Burton walks everywhere with Johnny Depp mm-hmm. now. I would play that game. Johnny Depp just feeding Johnny. bits of Johnny Depp to Cthulhu. Yeah. yeah I mean, How much of Johnny Depp do I have to give him to sate his desires? <laughs> his madness. Isn't his madness? <laughs> I'd play that. And I quite like Johnny Depp. I don't want you to think listening to that that I'm fantasising about chopping up Johnny Depp into little pieces. I'm not. I just thought as a video game It'd be an interesting I'd probably concept. play it, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like It's like The Walking Dead. I don't want to do lots of that bad shit but I'll play in the game. Mm-hmm. I'm looking forward to the first game where you're not the crazy one. Like, you're not. you're barely the protagonist. You're just the second fiddle to that Johnny Depp character and you're running around as he's doing all the set pieces and you're just trying to stay alive. Like if Alex Vance in Half-Life 2 did all the crazy shit that Gordon Freeman does and you're just following him around going, this is weird. Uh, yeah, yeah. I really don't want to be here. This is awful. I've got to say, the more I think about Half-Life 2, the more I think a lot of it was bollocks. <laughs> like, I mean, like, I, I really How love old? it. It's so old, though. I really loved it's it at so the time. Old. But I, I always, like, and there's one bit that always I just forget about and then it comes back. Like, And the fact is like, Alex Vance fucking dies and then comes back. Does she? Yeah, she gets killed. She gets shot in the back and then like she gets brought back by some of the Vorpids or whatever. Like, oh, yeah. Oh, God, it's, it's been like, a long time since I played that game. I know, right? It's, you, no, you were like barely alive at that That's what I'm it, saying. Right? It's so old and so seminal in so many ways. You can't be mean to it now. It's like beating up Wolfenstein. No, you can't look up. Well, no, you can't. It's Wolfenstein. <laughs> Half-Life 2 was one of the first games to do what it did. Can't remember what it did, but it did it well mm-hmm. and we should respect it. Because video games. Yes. Because video games. Do we have some questions? Is yes, we have got some questions. Eagerly uh, looking at. We've got some questions. Uh, Darren Sampson asks, has, has, oh yes, you specifically. Oh, God. Has, <laughs> has, that was genuine fear. At the Bratters mm-hmm. ever played a brick and mortar game of horse? I have not. I, I, I know why this has happened. The last video game or podcast we did was... Was it all questions was, about horses, by any chance? It wasn't even the question. It wasn't the questions that were to blame. It was the rest of the people on that podcast. It was... <laughs> 50% horses like it was I was you were on a podcast with 50 <laughs> <laughs> so was, it, yeah. was it you and one horse or you and somebody else and two horses <laughs> are horses even good guests on podcasts <laughs> they would have been better guests no. so oh. the, the, the topics were very horse heavy um, and I, I yeah I don't know why I've got this reputation I don't when I go home I don't even no, oh, I have just. I don't even I just, care about horses much. Yeah, I home. went. There's a reason I was the one that went and played video games. All right. Huh? This yeah, is. A, this I, I mean, like it, this is unclear. Like yeah. uh, Chris's sister actually sells horses. Mm-hmm. I think that's some. Uh, I actually, I made. A, I I was at one point when I worked with Chris. I just it was one evening. I just went slightly insane, ran away for five minutes, and then came back having produced an incredibly bad green screen. Yeah advert for horses um, <laughs> just, just just as a general concept it's still on my YouTube thing. channel yeah. you got about 7,000 views I have a friend it's, who worked at Wired and he, which means you're part of the Condé Nast publishing internal newsletter and he did one day receive an email <laughs> does anyone want to buy a horse very good condition <laughs> good lord four grand or whatever it was whatever the insert horse price here <laughs> yeah <laughs> insert, re- insert relevant horse price <laughs> um Mark Threadingham asks, have you guys ever had any mods for games that completely blew you away? Yeah, absolutely. The one game I've never really been able to write about because it means too much to me was Thievery for the original Unreal Tournament, which turned Unreal Tournament into multiplayer themes. There were some really good um, mods for Unreal Tournament. I I think I might have tried to download that one, but I couldn't get it working. I I won't bore people. I mean, you can imagine what Multiplayer Thief is like, uh, made by the people who went on to make Alien Swarm. Uh, they, They were a hell of a bunch of people, but a mod that blew my mind another way same era of golden age modding par paying for Half-Life 1 I want to say it was a French mod where you played teams of builders and you had to construct walls by running around collecting bricks the only weapon in the game was a brick so you'd run around run around look for a brick and you'd run back to your wall and put it in obviously what can you do with a brick if you see another member of the other team you throw the brick at them you can knock them down unconscious for a couple of minutes um, probably about 20 seconds but each team also had a foreman and the foreman could run around and blow a whistle if he thought it saw you throwing a brick <laughs> and penalise you so it was kind of like Scrap Heap it was like Mad Max meets Scrap Heap Challenge yeah. uh, I, I remember actually I think my favourite was uh, with Warcraft 3 actually just the modding scene the, for that oh explosion. god my god that yeah. And I think it was mainly because of the fact that, that because Warcraft 3 was such a fucking great game 
I really want Blizzard to just make another yeah. Warcraft. And oh, that, fuck your war, World of Warcraft. I mean, it, it was fun, but I'm done with it's it. It's a shame like the, the Starcraft stuff doesn't seem to have the same level of community there. Oh, they try so hard. Yeah. The modding but, tools are right there in the exactly. menu it, of it, it's, StarCraft it's, too. I'm not I really think, sure. Yeah. I think it's maybe how they present that interface. It, it, it's, it's hard to get new maps recognised. But like the Warcraft free stuff, Tower Defence and They've games like Dota wouldn't yeah. be anywhere near the same so might not even exist so without, they without had, like, like that they had so many character models like because the Warcraft 3 campaign had so many characters and so many it was one of the most generous games I've ever played and the fact that it's like hey you finished the first campaign as a humans now the story continues as the elves and then hey you finished the did no. you, did you, when you played that did you no, know that was going game. next and then no I, no, I didn't I, even no I, I, and you know what I, I wouldn't have probably been upset if that first campaign had been it, I would have. Yeah. I, I would have felt. Oh right, okay. That's like, like, that I feel like you get towards the end of it, and then it's like you play the next race. And obviously, they did that with Starcraft as well. But you got four races, yeah. and the story also just it wasn't even like now. The problem with Starcraft is it's always a bit like now on the other side of the galaxy. Yes. Yeah. Whereas the great thing about Warcraft Three was it just it told the story of a kingdom collapsing, and I love how it started with like somebody coming in and being like saying to the human king, "You need to leave this land." You need to leave this land now yeah. because there is a, there is a scourge over. coming oh, so, God. and you need to leave. And they all laughed at him and were like, oh, GTFO. <laughs> uh, and then he was like, what, what else? Yeah. What else? Yeah. And then, yeah. And then the, basically it's the, the human campaign is just them failing it, miserably to not be murdered by the undead hordes. I, I really, really enjoyed the Warcraft lore. It's, it's partly why I'm like, I'm excited or not excited. I'm, Intrigued by the the movie that they're going to eventually do with with the that license, just because I, I don't know I, I I think there's there's a lot to work with there. I think but I just, yeah, yeah. With with the World of Warcraft stuff, um, and maybe that's just because of how MMOs have to work. That that story feels like it's it's run out of ideas a little bit. Now. Yeah, like that with the um, office, obviously, should big character. That's the Warcraft problem is that I suppose they've done so much stuff with. They've done after Lich King. Like, where do you go after that? Yeah, you possibly go after. I, that? I think you're right. I mean, that's the thing is they've done so much stuff with the law through World of Warcraft that I think if they made a Warcraft 4 now I'd just be like what the fuck it'd is going to, it, on it'd now it'd have to be like, almost entirely new characters I think because there's, it seems like they've, they've had to do as much as they can with all of those but things. I do think what was lovely about Warcraft 3 that I think Starcraft has never quite managed is Starcraft well actually Starcraft the original Starcraft had a fucking awesome story the same thing but then with Starcraft 2 I enjoyed it but it, it just became more of a personal thing it became more of a Hollywood like yeah. it's all about Jim and uh, well, if you look at something uh Blizzard have not made a, a, like a really strong story. It's all been slightly fluffy since Warcraft Three, mm-hmm. yeah. like Starcraft Two, and then Diablo. Th- Diablo had an amazing story, and that should have been there with Three and wasn't. Uh, and then World of Warcraft is obviously off the rails. Yeah. God, I mean, I don't know how you. We would've... need another dungeon. Oh fuck! Um, yeah, we I need another dance back. animation. <laughs> okay, MC Hammer. Yeah, yeah. I just loved in uh, in like you know Warcraft Three and the Frozen Throne, just watching like just especially with Warcraft Three, just watching Arthur slide. Yeah, and getting to the point of being like, "Oh, but sire, we can't do this because all these people are gonna die." He's like, "This is important." And, like, it, it, and at first, you think, "Yeah, you're right. Like, people are gonna die, but we have to do it." And then oh, you're like, "Oh God, no! Actually, he's becoming evil." Arthur was <laughs> Arthur was the Walter White of the the Warcraft <laughs> universe. You understood it at first. You were like, "Yes, all right. He's doing this for his kingdom. He cares about his people." Oh God, oh God, he's a really bad person. You know I what? You're, fu- like you're, fu- you're fucking spot on. That's uh, that is an uh, incredible analogy. Um, so yeah, um, we'll move on. Dan Howard, question: What's a good game to get an avid board gamer who long fell out of love with computer games back in love? Well, I'd say XCOM. Yeah, XCOM. Uh, XCOM. Just because it's the XCOM is so much like a board game. Yeah, game, well, they, yeah, right. famously. C- Civ has a, a board game kind of feel to it, right? And just in the way that the map works and the tiling. Sure. Uh, yes. I mean, basically any strategy game. But if they were in love with with video games, they probably they're probably they, familiar they with might yeah. well have yeah. played yeah. XCOM as well. well. I don't know if they if they fell out of love with. Yeah, I'm thinking it must have been a couple of years ago. Yeah. No. I mean, the new XCOM is phenomenal and. God, what else? I mean, you know what? I would even say ignore what video games are aping within board games. I'd say look at what video games are doing that's great. I'd say play Gone Home. I'd say play pa- play Papers, please. Mm. Yeah, So it's like, look at what cool things are happening in video games because it's not what you thought. But I was. just like the fact that XCOM is like the sort of game you sort of think, this would be a great board game. But it would also be one of those board games that would so take fiddly. fucking so ages fiddly. to set up. Because <laughs> you yeah. have to be like looking at the book and setting the map up right. And <laughs> yeah. it's one of the things where it's like, it just does all that for you. Yeah. It's just quite nice. Um, um, another another uh, more kind of traditional gaming question Matthew Vanal asks 
Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition has launched. Oh man, yeah, I just got my Any copy. Any interest in that? It's interesting. Dungeons and Dragons has always been really interesting. I mean, I'm actually reading a book on the history of it at the minute, and that's bizarre because <laughs> it's... No, I'm not going to say it, I'm not going to say it. <laughs> no, go, no, no, you know what, no, you can... No, dude, I listened to... Uh, I don't actually play Dungeons and Dragons, only because I haven't, I haven't got the, the right friends, but... Um, I, I, I listen to other people play it and absolutely <laughs> love it. Like, there's a, Do they know? There's a, there's a podcast called Critical Hit, which is like okay, right. a, oh, right, a, yeah. a big I just thought you meant like you just stand outside. <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, God. <laughs> well, Chris, what are you doing here? I didn't know you were here. <laughs> oh, yeah, and I was just dropping something off. Just, yeah. I'm leaving now. <laughs> it's it's You wouldn't believe the degree to which it influences video games from like why are hit points, potions, wizards a thing? It all comes back yeah. to D&D. Why is fantasy a thing? Like, well, thankfully, we don't have the strength 18, strength 18, 10, strength 18, 50. Oh, man. Yeah, we have Jesus worse stuff, Christ, man. If you look at sphere bad. grids in FF10, that's weirder than anything in a lot, like, Yeah, D&D a lot of the Final Fantasy edition. systems are really weird when you go back to them. Man, now. any, like, look at Dota. Dota. Dota is way worse than anything in D&D 2nd Edition. But, uh, I mean, it's always interesting kind of seeing what they do, and with 5th Edition, it's... One of the things that they're doing that I do like, annoyingly I've just got the starter kit, that's all they've released, and that's just levels one through three, but a cute thing is they're now doing a thing I've seen in JRPGs where between levels one and three, that'll probably take you like one or two play sessions, and that your characters only have quite basic rules. Mm-hmm. Then when you hit level four, it introduces other mechanics, which D&D hasn't quite done on such an obvious level, so it's like the game expands if you're interested enough to keep going. And you can also start at that level if you want. So D&D kind of grows with you in that respect. And aside from that, it's just all trying to be quite streamlined. But I'm, I'm, I'm interested. I'm interested, but I don't know. We've, we've recently on the show, obviously, Dan started playing the Star Wars RPG. Yeah, there's nothing in it that's... Yeah, and it's more like... I think the problem is, like, I, I had fun with Dungeons & Dragons when I was younger, but I feel like I I have so little time in, in this life. Yeah, and if you're going to play realm, one RPG... If I'm going to play RPGs, there's so many interesting ones that I'd like to play. And I sort of feel like Dungeons & Dragons, why would I... Why would I do that? Why would you do, choose D and D over either the indie RPGs or you know Star Wars or uh, you know God? What's the? Even you were talking about Deadlands, just sounds fascinating. Deadlands, you know, like, but there's a million really, really good uh, yeah RPG settings. I think D and D isn't one of them. I think like I can imagine, I can see why it was so big back in the day because people are still so fucking excited by all that Tolkien shit. You know, like it was like oh we're actually doing that. But I've spent my entire life growing up with with old elves and goblins and all yeah for that reason dragons. I can. If I I do have a part of me that wants to go play indie and just we played it uh, on Tuesday for Shut Up and Sit Down when we were just meeting and playing games and being able to tell Brendan like he swung a sword at a goblin and decapitated him it's like there is magic there mm. that is immediately there that there wouldn't be you'd have to warm up your friends when you yeah. RPG yeah. setting with this it's like you find a chest you open it there's 14 gold pieces and you put them in your leather bag and you describe that and your friends lose their shit yeah that's what I, I'm still there I still want that <laughs> yeah <laughs> I don't know what love is or right. elves, elves and gold yeah uh, just, be a dwarf just, be a grumpy yeah. dwarf yeah. have a good time and finally Niels uh, asks, and I've had a few people talk to me about this actually today, um, and a few people mentioned uh, in the video I put up today about the uh, kind of esports thing. <laughs> a few people said, oh, that was good, but it would be actually good to, to hear something serious about it. He wants to know, <laughs> uh, please talk about the segregation in terms of female, uh, male segregation in esports. I, I don't know. I, I think you gave it the respect it deserved. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it seems... I do think you did have a really interesting point that you mentioned. I'll probably say that because I, I thought that was obvious, but obviously it wasn't. Um, <laughs> in my mind, like the, the whole reason, the reason I made a silly video about it, which was basically just taking the piss out of all of the things that in the culture of traditional sports are just really prevalent and really fucked up and things that nobody's really doing anything to stop. Mm-hmm. Um, and so my video is basically just sort of joking and saying that, yeah, no, women shouldn't be allowed to do these sports. And also we should do all these things in esports. And it was just basically the point of being like, why when esports are already doing so well and making their own like history, their own culture, history and their own culture, and their yeah. own existence. You're breaking your ground as well. Why would you copy off? Why, yeah, that? when there's so much stuff if, about sports that is bad, why would you try the, and carbon copy when you can pick and choose? You can be like, I'm, well, we're not going to do that, obviously. Yeah. And the weird thing is, like, I, I, saw, I saw the esports. <laughs> They do the segregation within esports, like the main body, I forget which uh, country it's based in. 
but um, they segregate it. And I was reading an article about this, and uh, the problem, the thorn in esports side, is that chess doesn't segregate its players. And but it's, it's like, like, yeah, fuck chess. Yeah. No, no, I, I, no I, it's I, not fuck chess. It's like, but that chess doesn't segregate its players means that we should be more like chess. Oh no, I thought you a, said I thought you said chess did. No, chess doesn't. No, no. So it's like, don't well, fuck chess. <laughs> I, I don't get that. That doesn't make any sense, though. Why is that? The, it's problematic the because reason? sports do segregate, and the argument is that maybe video games should be looking at chess instead because chess is an example you can hold up. But that chess has done it wrong. Like this, well, I, the, I, I get in in some sports there's a physical reason why. Oh no no no! no, no, no you misheard. You misheard. Mis- 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 well. oh, right, okay. Maybe you missed chess. It. I don't know. Chess doesn't segregate. Which okay. means men and women can play yeah, together. Right, going. Yes, so that video gets so chess would <laughs> both. Ah! So what was it? Was the problem for esports is that chess is a it makes them look bad because chess allows girls and boys to play together, and esports doesn't like that because esports doesn't let boys and girls play. I don't together. get it. It almost they almost want to they want to be seen as and it's this classic thing that it's this legit legitimacy, right? Like even when things are doing so well, they want the people in charge, the people who they see to be the real deal, to turn around them and pat them on the back and go, "Yeah, you're doing well." You are and a it, sport. I mean, it, that's, you see what that, that's all they want. You see this all the time. Like you see the way that like. Um, like the Yogs cast, for example, making fucking shit tons of money on YouTube and have been for a while. But they but, want respect. But they want respect, and because of that, they've been turning up to industry events and they've been hiring industry people because it's this thing that they clearly want to be seen as media. They want to be seen as a media outlet, and they're not content to just have an infinite bucket of money. They want <laughs> to be respected by the old guard, and the same thing with like they've people out, on the internet. Same, yeah, they've outgrown it though in some respects. Like, oh, no, absolutely in a different way. Have. So but he, they still is, probably probably want yeah. that you know, there will be an element of them that will feel like they've earned respect and until they've got that respect which they may never really get um, mainly because everyone's like fuck you guys you've got loads of money you don't need respect <laughs> yeah. we get respect and pennies you can fucking keep your money but um, it's the same thing with people on the internet like people like you know, making internet videos people will want they want to do TV, you know. TV's like the holy grail. Like. It's so, and it's, it's not because it's bollocks. bollocks. Yeah. Like television is. I mean, like, I couldn't believe how bollocks television is when I worked with it briefly. I mean, it was, <laughs> it's like the money's quite good, but everything else is a fucking pain in the ass. It's the thing of like everyone wants to be the Top Gear of games, and it's like, can't we just be our own awesome thing? Yeah, <laughs> like, like Top Gear it, wasn't trying to be the Top Gear of anything. It just takes forever for anything to happen because there's like thirty people working on things, and everyone's got their own little specific job, and no one has any control and the products you end up making end up being nothing well, like you thought they'd be because so many other people have been it, involved and God. it's like why why would you aspire to be just like something which is demonstrably not very good and so uh, we, yeah. maybe we should make it clear then we feel it's ridiculous yeah. that these yeah. things should be segregated and uh, boys and girls should be allowed to play together that's Although, why yeah. you yeah. know what doing what you want is entirely allowed with it if it makes you comfortable in your particular social group maybe it's fine but it's not behaviour that should be demonstrated by bodies that people look to it just seems to be generally that the thing is like you know it makes sense to have um, male and female separation within sports because there are physical differences and it would not be fair mm-hmm. with physical athletes well but see this is why there should be a Quinns League in Starcraft 2 because I've been playing that recently <laughs> and it's not fair <laughs> kids can put in time fuck that that's the thing is, but it's like when you especially with something like Hearthstone it's a card game yeah. it's like are the cards very heavy mm. like, like <laughs> um, no they're digital cards but it doesn't make any I don't know I mean that's uh, yeah, not is, enough people have been asking why within within that decision so that's a reply I mean I don't know a few there people there has been some backtracking on that though no, they, they've today, already they've yeah, already yeah. backtracked and actually said oh we'll sort it we'll sort it but we were very stupid <laughs> Um, we very very stupid which is just really stupid I mean what the mm. fuck guys like it's like they just it, like mindlessly aping the things that have happened before just because they've happened before I saw one in the comments on my video being like I don't see why people are making a big deal about this like I've been doing this stuff for years and Counter Strike has always had like female teams and male teams it's like why like, <laughs> coming back as a retort well it's always been like this before yeah. it's like well done fucking Captain Clue Clucks yeah keep on hanging people up on burning crosses <laughs> if that's what you've been doing so it's like it's not an argument like we, well, we've always done this it's like, <laughs> like, if you think if that's the, an argument you're about to say just stop yeah. and think of something else to say but yeah hopefully that answers it because I think a few people were like oh this was funny but it's a shame you didn't make a proper video about it I mean it's almost too obvious a point to even yeah, want to yeah. make that was my point was yeah. it's like it, in my mind the whole thing was so fucking dim that I thought <laughs> it didn't deserve anything other than flippant disregard of being like <laughs> you guys are idiots but hopefully they're learning if only learning from the fact that when the internet 
punches you in the face, you have to realize that you've been a dick. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, everybody will play it. Half stone, half stone together. together Didn't like half stone very much. I think it's rubbish. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, you could do whatever the fuck you want with it. Frankly, yeah. um, I think there should be a rule that nobody can play Hearthstone and they have to play Netrunner instead. I think that would be great. I mean, I've only played one game of Netrunner and it's it's infinitely more interesting. Than, I took uh, Brendan to my uh, Netrunner meet uh, a couple of nights ago, and it was, it was like below decks of the Titanic. Everyone was like getting him drunk and hazing him, <laughs> trying, to, trying to paint him Dance. like one of their French girls. Yep, yeah. just trying to make take his clothes off and lie down mm-hmm. put him on a card initiation it's crazy it was an initiation and then the very next day he snapchatted me pictures of him like unwrapping the box because he's bought it yeah you see I've, I've played that one game with you and I want to play some more because I feel like now I've played it once I could probably sit down with the manual and actually understand it but mm-hmm. you do have to play a game to get yeah the manual is awful uh, it's yeah fantasy flight need to sort that shit it out. is very good it is very good and it's also it's one of those collectible card games that doesn't I mean, it's expandable card game. Well, that's the thing is, it's expand- but the thing is, this is why I fucking can't be doing with with a Hearthstone. Is it's the fact like, it's uh, Netrunner is a card game where you have to physically buy the cards, right? And yet you can get like amazing decks, probably spending a far less money than buying fictional cards. I have heard with Hearthstone, you drop about thirty five quid on it, and then you can melt all the yeah. bullshit cards yeah. you get into magic alchemy jelly and then forge in your alchemy jelly forge the cards you need it is weird they do but it, then you've they, still only got one deck that's really good they, I think they do it they do it <laughs> I think I don't know no. they do free to play it a lot better than the most but yeah it's 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 so difficult to get See, out of the, the back of your mind I don't, I don't think they do I think I think they do free to play wrapped up in nicer paper and that's my beef with Arsenal and not a lot of people agree with me for it to be fair and that's fine but I really think that it's just that they've kind of like a lot of people are much more forgiving because they do it nicely. Mm. And I think if it was, a, if I think if it was an EA card game, yeah, yeah, with Mass Effect characters, people would Fuck be that. tearing down the curtains. And Mass, Effect, on Mass Effect's multiplayer was was outrageous. It wasn't fair. It wasn't balanced. It was pay to win. I tell you, <laughs> <laughs> the top of those cooperative leaderboards, and they had no right to be there. Yeah, they precisely. So it's just yeah. So I, I think it's just a case of um, they're one of those companies that can get away with it. Uh, I mean, it's not like outrageous, but it's still like in my mind. Uh, yeah, like expecting to pay like 30, 40 quid. Eh, it's too much. It's too much. It's, I, I've probably spent about 40 quid on stuff in Dota 2 and I have spent a thousand hours playing <laughs> I, A so. slight side point, but um, one of the guys I wear with, Steve Burns, was at a uh, preview event for Pro Evolution today and they're, I think they're going after the kind of ultimate team thing that FIFA has mm. in some respect. I didn't really pay too much attention. It's not, not my kind of game. But one of the quotes that came out of it was that you can hear that, you can eat paraphrasing but you can either essentially have time or money to win <laughs> you have a lot of time into it or money and that's that's probably the most honest thing I've heard about um, that kind of sale yeah, so what, what do you value more yeah. your time or your money I thought time is money time is money friend that just makes me think of Gregory Horror Show do you know my name anyway uh, we'll wrap it up there but thank you very much for joining me again chaps oh pleasure and thank we had quiche absolute pleasure we did we did have quiche we did I got quiche. to broadcast the extra Odyssey music to the unwell to the welcoming ears yeah. of everybody I feel bad the people who recorded the podcast last night which is last week's podcast didn't get any dinner you guys got quiche oh, actually, and I you lucked out on the, the quiche uh, um, train train <laughs> the, the train was, pulled into the station <laughs> I was doing a one-armed bandit actually oh one-armed bandit the, the quiche all aboard jackpot. the quiche train how annoyed would you be if you won like if three quiches ding, came ding, up ding. in Vegas <laughs> <and just> quiche <laughs> pulls into the quiche man. I'd be thrilled if it was good quality quiche I'd be down with yeah that. but those things are dirty man like, I'll see money. you guys in quiche Vegas <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much for listening and we'll see you next week goodbye bye everybody.